Hey, book friends. This is science fiction and fantasy author Lindsay Baroker. This is my first uh, YouTube recording of a podcast. I guess this isn't a podcast. This is a Q&A that I've decided to do that would be a fun thing to do for, for readers or anybody who happens to stumble across it on YouTube. But um, I think that would be nobody. But we will give it a shot. Um, I, uh, I got a snazzy new mic, which I uh, could not get to work. So apologies. Hopefully the headset will do for today. And if I do more of these in the future, I'll try to get things a little bit more professional. But this is my first time recording a video, just me myself talking to the screen. It's super awkward. I, I've done interviews and that kind of thing. But um, hopefully you'll get something out of it. Or, or you know, I'm going to go ahead and put uh, the questions that my uh, my readers have given to me via my Facebook page. Uh, I will be using those as a basis for the show today, and I will put them down in the description. I think it will be on there on YouTube, so you can jump around if there's only some things that you are interested in. I'm going to attempt to share my screen now, put together a little presentation. Does that look like it? No, there it is. Yeah. Oh, can't be covering up the dog, guys. All right. You can tell that I am an author and not an artistic person of any kind. Uh, if I actually do these regularly, I will pay somebody to do it like skills that can match colors and put together stuff like this. But um, so this is what I'm going to be covering today. Just a couple questions that people gave me, uh, kind of my path, of how I got here. Uh, I am a full-time author. I have been since about 2012. I think that was when I kind of officially let the, the day job go, and I've been doing this full-time. I have written, gosh, I don't know, more than 70 novels in almost in that time period, in about 10 years. And uh, I did not start out that prolific, but it kind of has happened over time. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about how I got there and then uh, asking, answering a question about character uh, tips for newer authors that are trying to get started now, uh, how much research I do. And then the last best question I say for last dog dragon hybrid question. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> All right, let's jump into the first question. Let's see if I can figure out how to advance the screen. This is a challenging thing to do. I have gone ahead and blotted out your last names, guys, just because these are such amazing questions. I don't want people to uh, feel they need to stalk you afterwards to find out where they live because um, they'll probably want to send you things. Uh, yeah, probably not. You know, the great thing about humor is when you're writing, you get to edit it. When you're, when you're on your own, on the fly, it's really hard to be smooth. All right, so Brenda asks, um, I just asked for, you know, do you guys have any questions for me on my books, on marketing, on publishing, on any of that stuff? And this question from Brenda was uh, very nice. You are a special person with a seemingly unlimited imagination, a sense of humor, and the ability to share. Tell us more about how you got here. Um, only child, read a lot as a kid, had a lot of imaginary friends, <laughs> uh, did sports. Uh, that was sort of my uh, social outlet, but I, I read a lot. We did a lot of road trips for swim meets. So just, you know, three, four books a week, at least as a kid, reading in the back of the station wagon back before we had seatbelt laws. So I was just back there with all my blankets and books as we drove like from Seattle to California to compete in swim meets. So that's sort of where the genesis of where I learned to love to read. My mom's also a reader. But as I was growing up, it was kind of implied that as an author, you know, you're never going to make enough to make a living. So go into computer science or business or something like that. Uh, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do after high school. So I ended up going in the army for four years, which was super motivating to go back and get an advantage or just a degree to do something else. Uh, lots of buffing floors I have memories of and KP and, and that sort of fun stuff. Uh, it was a way to pay for my schooling, though. Um, parents were, you know, we weren't poor, we weren't rich, we were just kind of middle of the road. It was definitely, you have to pay your own way through college kind of thing. So it was a good experience. Uh, again, I wasn't really thinking writing, even though I loved it. I just started lots of stories over the years. I was great at starting stories and not finishing them. Um, sort of got a little better uh, in my 20s. I joined an online writing workshop. I think it still, ex still exists, the science fiction and fantasy online writing workshop. And it got me kind of motivated because you would post a chapter and other people would critique it. And then you would also critique their chapters. And what motivated me was partially people asking for more. Like if you hadn't posted for a week or two, they're like, hey, when's the next chapter coming? And then also seeing other people succeed, like they'd finish their novels and they'd query agents. This was early 2000s. So kind of before self-publishing and the Kindle became a thing and the other e-readers. 
So that was pretty uh, motivating. Like I, I love seeing other people's success. It makes me want to, you know, work harder and see if I can do what they did. So it, it did take a while. Um, about 2009, 2010 was when I actually had a couple novels finished, and I was really ready to query agents and go traditional publishing route or try to. But that was sort of, um, you know, I got my first Kindle about two months before that, and I remember thinking at the time, oh, I'm not going to stop, you know. Who wants to read ebooks, right? I'm just gonna uh, use this for traveling because I did like the idea of like, oh, you can put like five books on it, and you don't have to carry a whole bunch of paperbacks with you to the airport. So I got the Kindle, and then like within a month or two, I, I started like stumbling around. I found people who were blogging about they just uh, self-published their stuff to Amazon, and um, there were, Smashwords was sort of the other way, the distributor that you could get into Barnes and Noble and some of the other stores back then. Since then, many of the stores allow you to upload directly, but, you know, here was somebody having a lot of success that had been traditionally published and said, hmm, enough of that, and started putting his own titles up there, and there were other success stories, so that made me think, huh, this, this would be fun, uh, and at the time, I was, I'd kind of figured out a way to make a living on, on my own, working from home. Uh, about the time I finished up school, I was having a lot of pain in my hands, kind of repetitive stress injury stuff. And I was thinking, wow, I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to like work a normal job at a computer. I used uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking, which is voice recognition software for a while. And I was just imagining being like uh, in some cubicle somewhere chatting on my computer while the people next to me were like, what is going on? So I figured out how to make a living kind of gradually it was a, while I was still finishing up school by doing content writing and creating websites and putting my content out there. And then I would, uh, I've, I learned enough of the kind of the search, <laughs> search engine optimization stuff to start getting a little traffic to my sites. I was actually blogging and well, eventually blogging. There wasn't really blogging software back then, but um, so I was just kind of making templates and putting the pages up there. And then I started making money. Google AdSense came out maybe 2003, 2004. And uh, it was, again, I saw other people having super, super success that already had a bunch of websites. And so I decided to put that on my site. And uh, I learned about affiliate programs too. So that's sort of how I was making a living from about 2004 on to 2000, 2010 is when I f first published my first novel. I uh, did not make any money to start with. I was not an overnight success. I, you know, I think I tried to bribe people. I was like, if you buy my book, I'll buy your book. <laughs> and thinking like, oh, that will probably make Amazon think my book is popular and it will show it to more people. Did not work that way. But um, as with the other web stuff that I learned how to do, I gradually learned how to market and promote my books. I kept writing more books in my first series, which was The Emperor's Edge, a kind of a high fantasy series. And it is still a fan favorite. Uh, I don't know. I think the characters had been in my head so long by that point, you know, because I was always making up stories in my head even before I got serious about writing. And that, uh, by the time I published about the sixth or seventh one in that series, probably about the sixth one, I was actually making more money at that, uh, you know, this was after a couple years, than I had been uh, at the other job, which was uh, actually, it was a lot more. It's a lot more work. I work a lot more now, but I really love what I'm doing. Like, <laughs> it's the coolest job being able to make up stories about dragons and spaceships. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that for a living? Uh, the the other stuff I was doing before, worrying about home improvement, uh, that was fine. It was. I actually enjoy real estate and like all those home <laughs> home and garden shows. So it was a it was fine way to make a living too. But this this was even better. So that is a little bit about how I got here. It, it's been a road, you know, there's, there's been so many changes too in the 10 years I've been self-publishing, uh, especially as far as like how the marketing works, like what works one year doesn't necessarily work as well the next year. And I've always been very open to giving away things for free, like a free book one. I've got several of my book ones are free out there right now if you want to check them out. Um, you know, or like uh, I've even done free box sets. You know, I always, it's always to kind of lead people into the rest of the series or like, on my YouTube channel, the first thing I put up was an audio book of a, it's kind of a novelette. It was about a maybe 12,000 word story that I had my narrator do uh, for my Death Before Dragon series, which is urban fantasy and what I've been working on this year. And so it, the hope was like, oh, people will check that audio book out and then they'll want to read the rest of the series or listen to the audio books of the rest of the series. So that's kind of how I got here. I had nothing exceptional. I, like I said, I never really had like some, overnight success, big 
you know, bestseller hit thing that just took off. It's just been kind of gradually writing and putting out more novels over the years. Uh, consistency, it's super boring, but I, I feel like that is a kind of key component to having success. Every now and then somebody does, you know, strike lightning strikes or whatever the saying is and gets wild success, but that's, it's very rare. So gosh, just if it's, if you want to write it all, just start doing it and doing a little bit each day. And before you know, you'll have like 70 novels. <laughs> all right, let's move on to the next question. I did not imagine I'd be talking so long uh, on each question. So hopefully there's not a cap or anything <laughs> when I upload this uh, video. Next one. Katrian? Katrian? Gosh, it's just like my own characters. I put the names down. I'm like, oh, that's a cool spelling. And then when somebody asked me, hey, how do you pronounce it? I'm like, oh, I have no idea. Um, but she asks, I would love to hear what motivated you to write about a character like Z and how much your own geekiness seeps through. We notice. I mean, that's actually a super compliment because I feel like I've, I've met a lot of writers where they're actually really uh, have great personalities and they're super funny in person. And then you read their books and they're just really serious and kind of, uh, I don't know, flat's not really the word to say, but I don't know. I really enjoy it when somebody's personality comes through in their characters. And that's, I, so I take that as a compliment. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that that comes through. But um, for those who don't know, Z is the killer crusher kind of a robot kind of inspired by the uh, t-1000 back in the terminator movies uh, terminator 2 for those of you who remember those and um he my main character casimir actually makes him builds him he's a roboticist to protect him from other ones that have been sent to kill him so these are not supposed to have any personality and it's a bit if you think of like an android it's kind of along those lines they don't usually get the uh, the humor remember data data from star trek the next generation always trying to figure out humor and so I did Z kind of like that in the first couple books. Really doesn't have any personality, just kind of deadpan, definitely not telling jokes. But uh, my main character, Casimir, is very, he's very much a jokester. He's sort of that geeky kid. He has all these medical issues, really smart, but also got picked on a lot. And here he is being chased by killer robots. And, you know, he uses humor to diffuse situations and, and keep the bullies away if he can. So naturally, a robot that, that is capable of learning, because, you know, these are kind of artificial intelligence, it's sci-fi feature, uh, has been hanging around with him. And he does seem to develop some personality of his own over the series. And I think that that's just natural as a writer that your characters are going to develop over a series. You know, things happen to them, the <laughs> events happen, and it, with something like that, I don't know, it's just fun. It's, a lot of this stuff is not really consciously planned. You just, you know, you're just writing along and it's like, ah, you know, I think I made the joke in the series that uh, his best friend, Kim Sato, is like, Casimir, is your crusher developing more personality? And they're like, yes, I think so. And she's like, is that, that's like a bug, right? That's not supposed to happen because they're killers. And, you know, Casimir, the old joke is like, oh, it's a feature, not a bug. So that's an ongoing joke in the series. But yeah, these things just kind of spontaneously, spontaneously happen uh, as you're spending a lot of time in developing uh, the characters. Wow, I picked a really long one. I'm going to try to read, <laughs> read this, Wayne. Thank you for the question. I am one of your writer fans. I found the Six Figure Author podcast and have really benefited from your advice. Um, authors out there, I am one of three hosts on the Six Figure Authors podcast. It's also on YouTube and on iTunes if you want to check that out. Um, but then he says, I decided that since I had a brand new KU account that I would try the first book in your Death Before Dragon series. I have now binged all that have been released and I'm waiting for more. Anyway, my question is very much for myself and your new writer audience. What is your current thinking about the best way for a new series writer to get started? I have six in a series written at rough draft level. I have started with an editor and we will start on my first reader magnet. I plan to do a fairly rapid release, perhaps one a month there in the thriller genre. Ooh, move myself. Thank you for some great reading hours and all you share with us new writers. You're very welcome, Wayne. Thank you for checking out my books. Actually, when you start a podcast for writers or like a nonfiction topic, you don't really expect it to lead into book sales. So that's a nice perk when that actually happens. Um, but yeah, so that's why I'm kind of doing this YouTube ch channel more for my readers. I mean, that's kind of the goal, but I certainly am happy to an answer questions, uh, any tips I can give. So um, awesome that you want to write in a series because that is actually the easiest way to be profitable as a writer. Uh, a lot of times, especially traditional publishing, you know, 
you might you can think of some authors that do one one standalone stories and then write something different and a lot of the people though that are really successful at that started their career like in the 70s or 80s so they the consistency thing they've had a long time to build up an audience and that kind of works for them but in this kind of era that we're in, especially if you're self-publishing, it helps if you can, you can afford to spend more money advertising book one, or you can even give it away for free if you have a number of novels following it. And if book one is enticing enough that um, readers actually will go on and buy the subsequent books in the series. So if you've written six, that that's awesome. I, I usually, most of my series end up being six to nine, somewhere in that way. Actually, I have eight a lot, which is not good if you're trying to box them up into box sets of three, uh, as I was, have mentioned before. But um, if you have six, that's that's great. Uh, you know, Amazon ads, Facebook ads, BookBub, uh, sponsorship sites. There's a lot of ways right now that we can pay to sell our books. And that is the modern era that we're in. It's not like you're just going to put it out and people are going to find it. Uh, even social media, it's usually more, uh, you can do all you want, but it's after people have read your books, so they become fans and come follow you on Facebook or Twitter or, or the other sites. So you kind of need to be willing to either spend a little bit of money or just hustle a lot to, to get the books out there these days, it's, especially now. I'm recording this at the end of 2020. Um, it's gotten very competitive. There's a lot more books in the Kindle store uh, these days and in all the stores, all the other bookstores. So you really have to do something to stand out. But uh, if you've got six already written, excellent. So I would, you know, the rapid release is basically if you've written several ahead like that, you can do something what's called rapid release where you publish basically like one a month or for the first three months and then you might space it out. Uh, normal, <laughs> normal, other people who are familiar with authors outside of self-publishing might be thinking, wow, that's crazy. That's, that's a lot of books you write, that many. But you tend to find that uh, the more books you've written, the easy, I won't say it's always, it's not necessarily easy, but the more you kind of develop a process and it does become a lot quicker. I tell everybody my first book took about seven years to finish. <laughs> uh, it was not quite as dedicated then when I was, before I was working full-time at this, my goal was to write a thousand words a day. And that actually gets you a book pretty quickly in about two to three months, depending on the length. And, and then you have to edit it. And that's something that gets easier too. Like for me, usually I only do one major editing pass. And, and so like in the, that first book, I think I edited like three times and then I was like, the ending still sucks. So I, I put it away for a while, but I have uh, deviated from Wayne's question. So uh, what is your current thing about the best way to get started? So I think you're doing it. Uh, you would plan to maybe put up a very short pre-order for the first book so you can get the links. And then you can take a shot at trying to get uh, the sponsorship sites to, to take it. Uh, E-Reader News Today is one. Um, book, book Barbarian, if you do, oh, you said you do thrillers. So I think they might have a, a branch that's not sci-fi and fantasy. Um, you know, uh, David Gogren has a good list of these. <laughs> Go look him up if you're on YouTube of, of all the promotion sites. Although it can be hard when you're a new author, they usually want to see on a, you know, on a book they're doing for the first time, they want to have like 10, 20 reviews and a good review average. And, or they want to see the other books you've written have a good review average. I actually launched a pen name a few years ago completely anonymous, totally from scratch. And what I did was I made the first book free right away because I knew I wasn't really going to be able to get the sponsorship sites to take it. I, did, I didn't, wasn't didn't be able to get other authors to um, promote it to their mailing list or anything like that. I, I started that completely from scratch as if I was a new author. So I put the first three books up pretty quickly. Uh, I wrote them at all in advance and that's going to be hard to do. But um, so made the first one was 99 cents for about a week and to make it free on Amazon as of this recording you kind of have to dance around the system a little bit because 99 cents is the lowest they'll allow you to price your book at but if you make it free on Apple, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, those are kind of the other main competitors, Google Play, uh, all of which will allow you to list a book for free. Uh, Amazon should eventually price match it to free. So that can be a way uh, people will try a free book, you know, or, and you can get, there are some really inexpensive promos out there that are less persnickety, <laughs> less requiring of reviews, or, you know, I, I always feel like with social media, I feel really uncomfortable trying to sell somebody my book. Unless if they're a fan and I'm just doing the service saying, Hey, this is out now, you should check it out. That's one thing. 
but I could never sell cars. I could never sell anything because I don't want to bother people and I don't want to ask them for favors. I'm a hardcore introvert, despite the fact that I'm recording a video to go out to all, all the people. So, but I always find it, you know, free. I don't mind that. I'm just like, I'm giving them entertainment at no cost to them, except the cost of trying it out. So I, I find it a little bit easier to, um, to mention it. I, I don't know if you've started Wayne uh, putting together any, uh, social media sites or anything like that yet. You mentioned you're doing a reader magnet, which is, um, for those who don't know, it's basically something that is designed to get people to sign up for your newsletter. It's a free bonus or uh, it, you can also be, you know, you're putting it out there kind of like I was talking about before, making a free book one or even a free prequel that will then hopefully lead people into buying the other books in the series. So, uh, you know, I think you're doing the good, all the good things. I uh, just focus on, you know, uh, the, the other good thing about making book one free for a while, if, if that appeals to you, and it's not like it has to be permanently that way. I have some that I just make free for promos and then put back to full price, but it can help you get reviews in the beginning too. Uh, because like I said, it's a little harder to get the promo sites to share your book if you don't have reviews. So that's sort of the first thing you're going to be trying for early on with the book is um, getting reviews. Uh, get you know getting it out there it's just anything you can do like that's why I'm free 99 cents whatever you can do just to get that first book out there and then the subsequent books it's becomes so much easier if you get people into the series at that point especially if you get them onto your your sign up for your newsletter on your mailing list then you can let them know when the next one is out hopefully at that point they really enjoyed the first one and they're eager to get the next one and it's just everything after that is a little easier. All the launches, like a launch for me now is basically just, you know, put the new book up. If it's a later book in a series, announce it on my Facebook author page. I announce it on Twitter too, even though only like three people follow me on Twitter that are actually readers and book buyers. And um, Instagram, I started an account there. That's not a big place for me too. Facebook author page though is worth it. I would start working on that even if you're not, um, a big Facebook person now or don't have a lot of followers yet. I, I post like snippets from books and quirky dragon things since I, that's kind of become my thing. I have several series now with dragons in them, but yeah, start, just start working on that and um, you will be there. Uh, <laughs> hopefully. All right. Again, I'm, I haven't even looked at the time yet guys, but I know I'm talking way more than I meant to. I thought this video would take 10 minutes. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, Ellen asks, how much research do you do? Did you interview many dragons before starting the books? Of course, I interviewed as many dragons as I could find. I actually have that guy back there, the little wooden guy hanging on the mantle there and on the wall. It's my dragon shrine. I, I have to admit, I am a bit of an Etsy fan. They are not paying me to promote them in this video that perhaps 10 people will watch. But I, I so I, I, that's one of the things I share on my author page is, uh, I don't buy everything I share. I just share a lot of cool dragon stuff. But every now and then I'm like, ah, I, you know, got to get a little, little something. As far as research, so what I try to do, the main thing I do research for is this, more the science fiction. Uh, especially in my last series, I was trying to be a little less hand wavy And, uh, you know, I grew up watching Star Trek and Star Wars and there's like zero <laughs> science in, uh, especially Star Wars. Um, but, you know, I, I had, I had read the, um, the first Expanse book that I know that's not the name of the actual books. I forget. And I was like, oh yeah, there's a lot of people that actually want the, the science fiction or the space opera to have an element of uh, actual science in it. And it, it's hard because you want to tell these stories, especially if you like me, grew up with Firefly, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, you want to tell fun stories and not worry too much about how the artificial gravity is created. But um, so what I try to do for research, if it's something like that, is I just actually listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, by people that are sharing the actual science stuff uh, or if you were writing historical fiction or something like that, maybe you just kind of want to immerse yourself in podcasts and nonfiction audiobooks from that time period for like the couple of months where I'm still working on the last series but I'm getting ready to launch the new series I try to kind of absorb as much knowledge as I can ahead of time so that when I actually sit down to write, I'm not having to pause and, and go look up things on the internet because that's so slow. That's how you, you know, if you want to write a lot and become a full-time author and you, you might want to write like 5,000 words a day, maybe even 10,000 words a day, you cannot accomplish that if you're stopping all the time to go look things up. So I try to do as much research as I can beforehand. And then as I'm writing, 
if something I do have to research, like uh, the urban fantasy series, very research light, except for the fact that I set, decided to set the series in Seattle. And I not only no longer live in Seattle and haven't for almost 20 years, but <laughs> I grew up in Edmonds, which is a suburb north to Seattle. So I'm like, man, I know that area really well. So for urban fantasy, she ends up in the suburbs a lot. Um, but so yeah, I have to like go look at maps and I'm like, oh, I'm asking people like, hey, what, what's the name of a, a club down in Ballard that I can have my character visit? Um, but again, I'll just kind of like put placeholders a little, I'll look this up later in my notes or in my rough draft so they don't have a break from the story writing. Um, no, no interviews. I actually, I love people that I, I, I don't know how you do nonfiction and you have to go interview experts. Uh, my introvert self cringes away from that. I have never even sent an email to a person. I'm like, if I can't find it on Google, Google, it doesn't need to be in the story. All right. Uh, next question. Okay. This is the last question, guys. Sandra, since you love dogs and dragons, have you ever thought to put a drogon dog dragon hybrid in your books? They could have fur, but horns and scaled wings or something like that. Since they're a fantasy, you can make any creatures you want. If not one of these, what creatures did you think of adding? So this has actually been, I've had a number of people ask about dog dragons or droodles, which would be a dragon poodle. And I have not done it yet. I don't know. I have actually only put dogs in a couple of my series or pets of any kind, because here's the thing. <laughs> if you write action adventure stuff and your people are always getting shot at, they're going on spaceships, <laughs> they're like flying on dragons, it becomes really challenging to uh, keep the pet, like al not just alive, I mean alive, yes, we're not gonna kill off any pets in, in the stories. Highly unrecommend that, do not recommend, what's the word? Uh, readers do, will not forgive you for that. You can murder humans, no biggie, you know, if you're, thriller writer or whatever but not the dog but yeah it, it becomes kind of annoying uh to try to keep the pet alive and or not just like in active in the story and remember like oh shoot they have a dog that you know how did they get through that chasing with the dog when they had to climb on the train at the top of the train for a half hour uh and, and run from the bad guys so i i did have one series where there was a parrot and parrot was good because parrot could just fly off on his own if uh if the parrot needed to not be in the scene the parrot was off hunting for seeds somewhere and, and would come back conveniently to drop something in the hero's hands to help him out of a sticky situation which is a cliche thing to do parrots ferrets all those things that can sneak into jail cells all right so i'm not sure i quite answered that but i uh, have not done a dragon dragon yet um, you never know I was a big fan of the never ending story as a kid and I I'm not sure that um Falcor was a dragon drogon but um he kind of looked like a dog dragon I don't know what do you guys think uh and then there's my final question for you guys uh thank you for listening if you actually listen to all this you're completely amazing um if I will do more of these you know, give me a like, you know, like a thumbs up and subscribe and I will consider doing more of these. I, I love YouTube as a consumer of it. I have the premium so that I don't have to deal with ads, but um, it's, it's kind of a lot of work to sit down and record these and uh, put together a horrible uh, place card in the front of the presentation since I don't have those artistic skills. But yeah, um, question for you. What are you reading now? Anything good that you would recommend? I feel like my readers always want, they're voracious, you know, because I've written a lot and some of them read all of my books and they always want even more recommendations. And I would give like my three authors that I like and then I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know who's like publishing right now. That, that's awesome. So what are you reading right now? And, you know, thanks for listening. Should I do more of these? I, I do have the better mic, so I have to do at least one more so I can get it working. Look at this thing. I'll show it to you. It's a giant. Yeah. So I will get it working. It should be easy. I just, I had reached the cranky point. And uh, this is probably the point where I should turn this off and say goodbye to you. Again, tell us what you're reading. If you, if you made it to the end, thank you so much and have a great week.